Lord Hannay, your committee have been looking into the EU's global approach to migration and mobility. Can you tell us what prompted the committee to start that inquiry? Well, it's a pretty sensitive subject, this, uh, both in Britain and in the other European member states. Uh, particularly sensitive, of course, at a time when there's high unemployment and when the rise of parties on the extreme right in particular make immigration an issue. So we thought that for that reason alone, it was worth having a look at this. But also, we felt that it needed to be looked at because this is one of those areas where responsibility is divided between the member states who have absolute control on the numbers of legal migrants who come in and the European Union, which does not have such control, but which does operate in a number of ways through development policy, through helping member states with their migration controls and so on, cooperate so that that joint responsibility, we wanted to see whether that worked, uh, whether there were any implications of it which were good or bad for the United Kingdom. And finally, I think we were, of course, triggered off by the fact that the Commission had sent forward a document called the Communication on the General Approach to Migration and Mobility, uh, which was the basis of our study and which we wanted to see whether they got it broadly right or not. One of the key findings in the report is that there needs to be a more coordinated and flexible approach, uh, both at the EU level and by member states when it comes to managing migration. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you reached that conclusion? Well, let's deal with flexibility first, uh, because that's very important. Uh, at the moment, with high unemployment and a lot of pressure from outside by economic migrants trying to come to the uh, European Union, uh, there tends to be pretty heavy emphasis all round in every country on the need to control that. And that is understandable, though sometimes excessive. But if you look at the demographic pattern, the way populations are, are developing in the European countries, both in terms of ageing and in terms of a lowering of the birth rate well below the normal rate of replacement, you do, I think, come to the conclusion that over time, Europe will need rather a lot of economic migrants, particularly skilled and well-qualified economic migrants, if economic growth and prosperity are to be sustained. So there's a balance to be struck there, and that seemed to us a, a very important uh, part of the equation. Now, the other part that you ask about, which is how um, how is this being managed? Or should there be more coordination? Well, up to a point, we do not think that responsibility for controlling migration should be transferred from the member states to the European Union. And nor, interestingly enough, would the officials in the Commission whom we spoke to, nor even the members of the European Parliament whom we spoke to. Everyone agrees that this is too sensitive a subject too much a matter of national control to be, to be uh, capable of being changed without a great deal of upheaval and controversy, and nobody proposed it. But there are a lot of things that the European Union can do, uh, helping some of the weaker member states, for example Greece, to improve their frontier controls, uh, helping uh, all member states uh, to, uh, to integrate economic migrants into their societies when they come here by exchanges of, of peer experience and so on, uh, and also by operating some of the tools of development policy and uh, cooperation with the countries from which most of the migrants come, countries like Turkey and Pakistan, the countries of the southern Mediterranean shore uh, and the former Soviet Union. And so we wanted to look at all those issues, and that's what we've been doing for the last uh, three or four months. What were the other major findings that the committee reached? Well, we, uh, we concluded that, by and large, the European Union, what it was doing, it was doing reasonably well. Uh, the idea of mobility partnerships, which have now been negotiated with four countries, uh, Armenia, uh, Georgia, uh, Moldova and Cape Verde. They're very small countries on the whole, so you can't judge too much from them, but they appear to be working. That's to say they are helping 
those countries moderate the amount of uh, external migration but by helping them develop their economies, but also making the whole situation better controlled. And we think that subject to careful evaluation on each occasion, that system should be expanded. They are at the moment negotiating a mobility partnership with Tunisia, and there will probably be others. Wider regional efforts also, for example, how to handle the huge uh, refugee outflow from Syria and to ensure that that does not lead to a flood of refugees coming into the European Union. Uh, those regional efforts are important too. And we also looked at how development policies can work in such a way that the highly uh, developed area like the European Union doesn't cream off all the best people from developing countries and deprive them of their best educated and best qualified citizens. How can we uh, develop a kind of circularity, as it's called, so that some of the diaspora go back, uh, or their children go back, or they send remittances, and if so, how to make those sending of remittances a bit more efficient, a bit quicker, a bit less costly. Uh, all these are issues which arise, and also there is the need to insert the European Union, Europe, which is quite a big lump of the world, into the global consideration of these migration issues. There are a number of UN bodies and a forum which uh, Peter Sutherland, who is a former European Commissioner, Chairman of Goldman Sachs and BP, uh, who is the UN Secretary General's uh, Special Representative for Migration, he chairs this forum and Europe plays a very positive and very useful role in that and we wanted to look at that and we endorsed it. We did also look at areas where national policy exercised in our case by the British government, uh, whether it was positive or negative. And we concluded that broadly speaking, as I said earlier, it is right that national governments remain in charge. But we did identify one area where the individuality of the British approach seemed to us to be damaging to Britain. And that is in the control of the migration of students. Uh, we, like many other select committees, four others, including ourselves, have now recommended very strongly that the government should ensure that their policy of reducing migration, net migration, to tens of thousands should not lead to any impediments to the arrival of bona fide and well-qualified students here whose, uh, whose study here is very much in Britain's interest because they bring massive resources into the country, it's an invisible export therefore, because they help Britain's influence after they've studied and qualified and returned to their own countries, and they are not economic migrants in any true sense of the word because they are not doing jobs here. They are paying us money to teach them. And we concluded that the government's policies in this respect were not being successful that they risked damaging Britain in respect both of its competitors uh, in countries like the United States, Canada, Australia, but also in the countries of uh, the rest of the European Union, where more and more universities are teaching in English now and are therefore competitors of our universities. So we're trying to persuade the government, so far with not very great success, I'm afraid, uh, to ensure that students are not uh, affected in any public policy way by the attempt to get migration down to the tens of thousands. Uh, you talked about that effort to persuade the, the government and the committee have now published their report. Um, what are the next steps? Well, the next steps are that the government has to respond to our report. They have incidentally also got to respond to about four other select committees who have made similar recommendations and they have two months to do that. After that, we shall have a debate. Uh, in all the questions in the House of Lords and the debates in the House of Lords, it came up, for example, in uh, last week's debate on uh, external policy. It comes up in any number of questions on the issue of student visas. The overwhelming view in the House of Lords is that the government have got it wrong, that this policy, insofar as it impacts on students, is contrary to our interests, and that they need to make some kind of change to avoid that. Uh, I'm hoping that somewhere in the next few months uh, that penny will drop 
and they will understand that this is not an attack on the overall approach of trying to get migration under control, to get the border agency uh, to be more effective, and to stop bogus students coming here. If we're talking here about bona fide students, we're talking about students who have enrolled in well-known, world-class universities here, and who are certified by the universities as being there and being taught. These systems are now fully in operation, and frankly, the problem about bogus students has been hugely reduced in the last two or three years, and it is not in any sense a justifiable motive for clamping down on the overall uh, influx of students, which is good news for Britain. 